we will start. Good morning, this is the 36th District Democrats and we are so delighted to be interviewing Gina Top this morning for Seattle School Board position six. Over to you, Gina. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with the thundering 36th. Uh, as uh, Chair Crone said, my name is Gina Top, and I am running for Seattle School Board District 6, which includes West Seattle, South Park, Soto, Pioneer Square, and Georgetown. Really excited to be here seeking the endorsement of the 36 um, because I know how important LD endorsements are in the community and the important work that LDs do. I served as a chair, treasurer, parliamentarian, and of course PCO in the 34th District Democrats. Um, but now I am running for Seattle School Board. Um, growing up in Washington, I experienced firsthand these struggles of our underfunded schools. Still, my life was transformed by the teachers and counselors who really went above and beyond to support me. I'm here today standing in front of you all because of my public school education. And now, as I and my partner prepare to send our daughter into the same underfunded system, like many other parents and students and community members, I'm hearing from Maury. Seattle Public Schools faces a staggering budget deficit, roughly 104 million for the, not this coming school year, but the up next, um, they're talking about cutting, you know, buses and music programs, but even closing schools and laying off teachers. And it's clear to me in this moment, we need leaders with experience and I bring that experience. I've served as a chief legal counsel and policy advisor to the King County Executive, where I have managed complex budget and policy issues. I've worked to really prioritize equity and accountability and delivery of services. In my background, I also bring good relationships with state, city, and county leaders, and I can leverage those relationships um, to get more resources in collaboration with the school district. I look forward to answering your questions today. Thank you so much. Toby will ask our first question. Uh, basically, it lets you continue your introduction. Why are you running for school board? Yeah, that's it's perfect. It allows me to kind of finish finish off. Uh, so, you know, I bring I bring that experience with me, um, and I'm grateful to have the endorsements of the teachers union, the Seattle Education Association, as well as the Seattle Student Union, um, and both the Seattle Times and the Stranger, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, um, many elected officials. Um, I'm really running for school board for my kid, but really for all young people because I bring the experience with me to bring stability and transformation to our schools, really restoring parental and community confidence. I believe strongly that education is the foundation of our democracy, and there's no reason here in one of the most prosperous regions in the country, we can't have the best education system possible. So that, that is why I'm running. Gina, we've got another um, question up for you. Number two will be asked from Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Well, enrollment in Seattle Public Schools has declined since two, 2020. What steps would you take to reverse this decline? And is it worth reversing? Yeah, well, I think that I think that's a great question. So the reason enrollment is so important is because the school district is a, is funded essentially on a per student basis. So with declining enrollment, we see a declining budget. Um, and really there it's difficult to pinpoint the one cause for the declining enrollment. I think that really there is a trifecta or three three things that are causing enroll, um, enrollment decline. The first one is birth rates are declining. It's not really something I, I want to, to tackle or increase here in, in King County. Um, the other one is really affordability issues. You know, we're seeing families, larger families, you know, finding um, it more affordable outside of the city. So I think as a school board director, well, that's not something I directly affect or control. It would be something that I would advocate for, um, making sure that our city and county are investing both uh, in making this place more affordable and in affordable housing where there is um, how affordable housing close to schools and transit resources. 
And sort of the last uh, uh, item is really the um, kind of maybe what I would say dissatisfaction or lack of confidence in, in the school district. And that's really where the school board and the school district has control, trying to restore the confidence and rebuild the trust in communities so that way folks are excited to send their students to um, our public schools. And I really think that there's two ways in which we can um, um, do that as a school board. One is uh, sort of re-engage or better engage with our community. Actively listening to the concerns and the feedback from parents and students is essential. Oh, and I, and the other one I would say is, you know, meet our established goals. We have, uh, we have to meet the goals that we've established on an education level in both math, literacy, reading, um, career and, uh, career and uh, school readiness. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Our next question will be asked by Amanda. How will you uphold the rights, dignity, safety, and inclusion of all students, and what would be your specific focus to do so? Yeah, I think that I think that is a great question. All students need to make sure that they feel uh, safe, welcome, and included in our school district and classroom. And I think that there are a variety of ways in which the school district can promote making sure that occurs. I think one of the um, very specific things that we can do is make sure that our teachers um, are from the communities and uh, identify with the communities in which they are teaching. Uh, and I think that takes both retention and recruitment specifically of teachers, specifically from teachers who have um, backgrounds that maybe that match our students. I think the other thing is now I think one in 10 students um, at Seattle Public Schools, I um, could get, be getting that number wrong, but it's, I think it's roughly about that now identify as gender diverse. And it's time we really start preparing to talk through how we are preparing our teachers and admin to support them through their journey of uh, self-discovery. I think the last thing that I am really interested in is mental health services and making sure that we are providing mental health services in all of our schools. Um, there's recent study out of UW that said that is the number one thing that helps prepare students for success is making sure that they have the mental health services they need. And um, in these schools is the number one place where students receive mental health services. So we need to make sure that those services are in place um, and, and quite frankly, expanded as we look at um, budget issues. And I have a few ideas on how to do that, um, but I am running out of, out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Our final prepared question before we move into follow-ups will be from Shep. What are your thoughts on addressing the budget deficit? And if necessary, how would you, how would you approach uh, deciding which schools to close? I think that is a, I think that's a great question. And the question that, you know, we continue, uh, at, that is the number one question I'm getting on the campaign trail is how will you deal with the budget deficit? Because we are looking at a large budget deficit and looking at school closures. What I will say is that um, I bring to the table with me the experience to make difficult budget decisions. I've navigated challenging budget situations before, and I would say what I bring with me is a set of values in making budget decisions. And those values will help me navigate what closures or not, not closures, um, what things um, will be prioritized in the budget. And I think the first one is protecting programs aimed at you know, meeting our educational goals in early literacy, mathematics, and college and career readiness. The other one is avoiding cuts to services that contribute to creating uh, and cultivating safe, inclusive, and welcoming environments in our schools. Those sort of mental health services we talked about. Really making sure our educators feel uh, supported in our budget decisions because they are the ones on the ground doing the hard work every day uh, shaping our children's future. And then I think the last one is really engaging parents and communities in decision-making processes. Um, no one 
wants to have to make the decision to close schools. And I'm, you know, it's a tool that has been deployed before. I'm not saying that uh, that is what I would do, um, but it, it is definitely going to be part of the conversation, but we have to make sure that it, we are transparent and open about the steps and why we are taking those steps if, if we must. Thank you so much, Gina. We'll move to follow-ups and I'll put myself in the queue, but I'll see if um, anyone else on the e-board has a question before I jump in with one. Alex, I will call on you first and I'll put myself in after you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughtful answers. I really appreciate them. I just had one it's a really quick follow-up question to question number three. Uh, you had said that if you had more time, you would go into uh, some of the uh, mental health resources you would put in place for schools. So I'm really curious on what those are, and I want to make sure that we have the time to actually hear from you on that. Yeah. Um, so like I said, mental health resources is one of the one of the things I'm hearing most from community members about. You know, I will say, you know, part of my stump speech usually is uh, one of my counselors in, in, in high school myself had kind of helped put me back on the right track. So I know how important those services are to students. One of the models we're kind of looking at is, uh, and, and Rainier Beach is currently trying this out, is really working to create hubs around community centers. So partnering with the uh, city where they, the, you know, there are some resources in the community centers and having schools really connected more with those community centers that have those mental health services. I think that's one avenue that uh, is shown to be really successful and I'm interested in the data to see if we can that can be expanded. The other thing is that the city and county do fund our um, school-based mental health services through the uh, through some of their levies and I think that you know specifically Seattle as theirs comes up for it that's possible. <laughs> Sorry, you ran out of time. <laughs> No, that's fine. Thank you so much for that answer. Thank you, Gina. I have um, an advocacy point, but I'll save that for later if there's time. The question I wanted to hear more from you around is particularly in the North End schools, there's been extraordinary decline. And I'd love you to have some space to dig into more what you would do to be addressing the families who have left, that it is not that they have left the city and not declining birth rates, um, but we've seen a real drop off in our middle school in particular. And I, you know, the coming from a North End school and the families in the district we represent, I'd love to hear more of your ideas around that. Yeah. So you, the, I think that feeds to the sort of the dissatisfaction and lack of confidence factor that I uh, mentioned originally. And I think, you know, part of that is making sure that we both listen to the concerns from those parents and students, but also the school district has the obligation to um, meet and achieve its goals that they've set for itself. Um, when they are not met, it, be, and it comes sort of the school board's responsibility to adapt and change course. So when I talk about this, it, the school district has three set goals in um, early literacy, mathematics, and college and career readiness. And right now they are um, in the camp or the results are showing that unless course is significantly changed, we are never going to meet our goals. That's a problem. Um, so we need to make sure that we are adapting and changing course when necessary. Um, and in my perspective, we have not seen the school board willing to change course. Thank you, Gina. Jeremy? Um, can you talk? Oh, um, so I'm my daughter just started third grade. Her class, you know, they cut they cut one of the teaching positions in her grade, and her class is now thirty two students. Can you talk a little bit about class sizes and what that type of class size does to educational outcomes? Yeah. Well, congrats on starting third grade. Uh, my little one started preschool this week, which was a huge step for me. Um, and you know. I think that is exactly right. 32 students in a classroom is way is way too many. It's way too much on the teacher to be able to teach the full spectrum uh, that they need to do um, in a classroom. And it's also puts too much on the teacher to be able to deal with disciplinary issues that we want them to address. I, I was talking with a teacher once who, or once la uh, last week who said, you know, 
uh, is my responsibility to, you know, be in my classroom of 32 or 29 students. But when something goes wrong and I have to send a kid outside into the hallway, you know, I also want to de-escalate that situation without, you know, sending them to the principal or, you know, really uh, creating a more difficult situation for that student. But I also have to teach in my classroom and I need those resources. So if we are going to put 32 students in a classroom, we need to make sure that the, student, the teachers have the resources they need in order to be successful. Thank you. I'll see if there's any more follow-up. I do have one that I'll ask you, but I'll give the rest of my colleagues a chance to raise their hand. Okay, seeing no hand, um, <laughs> as, the, as the parent of a transgender child in a Seattle public school system, um, the, the bullying, the violence, the challenges have been perpetrated as much by the adults in the administra in administration, mm -hmm. um, the curriculum, as it has been by the peers. And so I'd love to uh, have any more thoughts that you want to share around how we are making our schools welcoming and safe for the LGB LGBTQ community at this time, particularly when the national conversation is so hostile. Um, I think that that is going to be, you know, this is a bit, I'm sorry, everybody forgive me, a bit of uh, both an ask, but also maybe an advocacy point. I think we also have mainstream candidates running for city council who don't believe trans girls like my daughter should participate in sports. So it is, you know, that that national climate is here at home. And so how can you, Matt, you know, how do you see yourself stepping into that as a school board director? Yeah. So, what, one of the things I mentioned earlier, and I did check the stats, it's one in 10 students at SBS now identify as gender diverse. And I think that the school district has failed is not the right term because there have been progress has been made, but there needs to be more on making sure that we are preparing our teachers and administrators to support them on their journeys. That's just a thing that we need to make sure is a focus. The other thing is I strongly believe as an athlete myself, that students should be able to play sports in the gender that they identify with. And that is a commitment I have made previously on the campaign trail and I will make again today. Um, and that is, that is so important. Sports has made such a transformative effect in my life um, and all students should have the ability to, to have that experience. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I want to say here, I, yeah, I'm running it's, out of time. It's a big conversation <laughs> that timer. or to a continued one, should you, um, whatever capacity you're serving our kids and communities in next. Let me see if there's a last follow-up from our e-board. Otherwise, we will dive into um, next steps. Is there a last follow-up? Uh, actually, I have one. Oh, Jeremy's hand is up. Jeremy. Sorry, I was I was just going to ask to take the rest of the time for her to wrap up. Barbara, did you have a more specific question? I, um, I, I'm going to, uh, it, it was a small question. So let's go according to your instincts, Jeremy. Oh, okay. Just, I was just going to say, you know, we've um, just, um, yeah. Do you have anything else that you want to tell us or that you think we should know that just, um, you know, just to wrap up the interview. Yeah, well, I am going to put in the chat my cell phone number and my email. So if folks do have uh, questions that they come up with or want to have longer conversations, because sometimes it's difficult in a minute to get out every all the details that you that you want and you got to kind of prioritize quickly what you want to say. So would love to have further conversations uh, with folks um, if there are specifics. I, um, like I said before, Education is the foundation of our democracy. We need to have a strong education system here in Seattle. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be in such a prosperous region. So I look forward to working um, and campaigning and hopefully um, gaining the endorsement from the 36 district Democrats. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. That concludes the formal part of our interview. And now we'll have a quick moment